Hi, this is Peter Beal, and in this, the fourth of the series of art history lectures I'm doing, I want to discuss art that emerges in the beginning of the 18th century through the end of the 19th century. This is a period of rapid and radical uh, social, political, uh, cultural, economic uh, change. Um, one of the things that's most important to consider, well, actually, there's several uh, currents happening in Europe, especially at this time. Um, one of the most important is going to be the uh, emergence of the scientific revolution, the transformation of European society and the economy uh, by that. Uh, another important aspect is going to be the French Revolution that begins in 1789 and destabilizes the notion of monarchy in Europe and really radically transforms most of the countries that we've been considering uh, up until this point. So the scientific and um, industrial revolutions and, of course, outright political revolution are really form the backdrop of much of what we're looking at. It really ushers in the era of modernity, especially after about 1850 or so. So let's begin by looking at currents in France at this point in time. We're looking right now at the east facade of the Louvre, the King's Palace in um, Paris. And this is uh, a product of the reign of Louis XIV who uh, his dates are, I think, 1638 to 1715. And he becomes monarch when he's actually still a boy. Um, he's one of the longest reigning monarchs in, in Europe, and he took great pains to establish a certain visual style that would uh, broadcast and, and prop up the values of his reign. He's described as one of the great absolutist monarchs that, in essence, all power in the state was invested in his own person. And the rigid formality and... Uh, precise uh, classical elements of the Louvre uh, facade certainly make that point very, very clear and certainly is a far stretch from the more flamboyant elements of Italian Baroque architecture. If we look at painting from the period of the later uh, 17th century, it's heavily influenced by the work of Nicolas Poussin, an artist who actually lived in, Fran uh, in Rome, even though he was French, um, and took great pains to recreate a kind of classical ideal in his work especially focused on the kinds of values we actually saw in the Louvre facade, which is to say geometric uh, forms, a strong sense of regularity, uh, visual harmony, and serious intellectual content. So in the uh, painting we're looking at here, St. John on the Island of Patmos, the sense uh, that the landscape has been arranged in that sort of classical or ideal landscape that we saw elsewhere in the Baroque is certainly brought to a kind of new and almost mathematical kind of precision. Academic artists certainly adopted the attitude of Poussin and created a, a new kind of academic didacticism, which certainly served the interests of Louis XIV uh, well. Poussin himself never was overtly political or supported a particular ruler, but his style, I think, certainly gave uh, impetus to this, um, this idea of art. A kind of competitor uh, in terms of promoting the interests of royalty in the 17th century in Europe, and an, uh, again, a kind of sense of opposition emerges with these figures. The competitor is uh, Peter Paul Rubens. And we see in this cycle of paintings, which is actually made for a French queen, although she's Italian uh, in origin, Marie de Medici, um, a very different set of values comes across, a sense of movement and abundance and dynamism. Uh, it's very clear, for instance, that Rubens drew from the artist's of the Italian Baroque, whether it's Caravaggio or Bernini, uh, in creating this sense of occasion and ceremony and, and uh, again, a very dynamic presence of the queen. The style of Rubens, which is much more coloristic and reflective of Venetian property uh, priorities, I should say, was quickly adopted by a school of French painters who called themselves the Rubenese and set themselves in opposition uh, to the Poussinese. A good example of somebody heavily influenced by the likes of Peter Paul Rubens would be Fragonard, who in his bathers creates an opulent, uh, pleasurable scene that really reflects the priorities of the Rococo, the art style that emerged in earnest after the death of Louis XIV in 1715, where the center of culture moves away from the relatively uh, rigid and, and uh, prescribed protocols of Versailles to the more freewheeling salons and uh, public spaces of Paris. And so Fragonard and his uh, teacher Boucher were great exponents of this new, very lighthearted, very organic, very Venetian-influenced uh, style of art known as the Rococo, which extended not just in painting, but also into sculpture. 
and in architecture. Rococo is very influential and dominates much of European art until probably about 1760 or 1770, when we start seeing paintings that we would describe today as neoclassical. That is, there is a very strong sense of a classical revival drawing upon uh, the work of Poussin and his uh, imitators and creating a more severe and moralistic style that promoted what neoclassical artists and other figures allied with them saw as a more upright kind of moral life. A good example of this is Angelica Kaufman's Cornelia pointing to her children as her treasures, a story taken from ancient Rome, and this is very typical for neoclassical art to use Roman or Greek history. She points to her sons, who will become leading public figures in Rome, as her true treasures, as opposed to the jewelry being displayed by the other woman in the picture. A more strident and revolutionary vision of neoclassicism is seen in the work of Jacques-Louis David in his Death of Marat from 1793. Here we have an ardent uh, French uh, revolutionary figure, a Jacobin, a very radical individual indeed, who's just been stabbed, or in the view of his supporters, martyred by a counter-revolutionary, a woman, Charlotte Corday, who's identified in the letter that Marat holds. We have this very interesting juxtaposition of classical form and a certain degree of religious uh, intensity and piety, and, and there's no doubt that David was modeling this upon uh, Michelangelo's Pietà, the irony being, of course, in the French Revolution, uh, the place of religion in the French Catholic Church uh, was marginalized or abolished altogether. But the sense, again, of simplicity, severity, and a very strong political message is at the heart of much neoclassical art. That begins to take a peculiar turn, I think, in the work of Ang. Um, and in Ang's Grand Odalisque, he depicts a Near Eastern woman, a kind of exotic and remote, and aloof, mysterious female, using many of the same kinds of aspects of technical precision and a, a very um, you know, finished and polished appearance of the work. But the hallucinatory aspects of the work begin to dominate, I think, upon closer examination as we're transported into a mysterious and exotic world that is very far from the moralizing and, um, you know, sort of traditional messages of neoclassical art. The contrast with neoclassicism and the style known as Romanticism is abundantly evident in the work of Eugène Delacroix, who also paints, in the example of seen right here, an odalisque. But here, brushwork is allowed to come through the sense of sexual um, kind of a abandonment, right, to, to one's passions and emotions is readily uh, apparent. In Romanticism, the focus is on subjectivity and feeling and a sense of, of freedom, a sense of being able to explore all aspects of the human experience, whether the beautiful and, and sort of exuberant and joyful or the despairing and dark and, and insane and violent. The latter, of course, is evident in the work of Goya, in his uh, eerie and really somewhat shocking image, Saturn devouring one of his sons. The subject is ostensibly that of Greek mythology, but one can hardly avoid comparing the nature of the subject to the various wars, especially the ones that affected uh, Spain that were brought on by uh, that uh, erstwhile romantic figure, or at least somewhat romantic hero, Napoleon. Uh, Saturn, of course, is blind and with this devouring intensity and uh, this, this, the directness and, and um, emotional intensity of the image clearly separates it from the likes, say, of Jacques-Louis David. In the work of Jericho, uh, known as the Raft of the Medusa of 1819, we see an interesting mingling of some, in, of some aspects of Romanticism all in one piece. It's a grand-sized picture showing the aftermath of a shipwreck far, far away off the African coast, far away from France, where the survivors are caught in this grim situation. Um, details about the, the wreck and the aftermath were released to the French public around the time that Jericho is painting. So we have this idea of nature as this overwhelming force, despairing states of humanity, illness, starvation, what have you. And of course, that brief moment of hope as they see a ship that's coming to rescue them. This painting was, of course, a cause celeb at the Salon exhibition because it was not just a dramatic episode, it was also a politically controversial one, and this is not atypical of romantic art at all.
Romantic art certainly develops the notion of the artist or the individual's idea with nature, and Caspar David Friedrich in his Monk by the Sea really dives deeply into that romantic state of mind, um, sort of asking us to wonder what's going on in the mind of the monk as he seeks or appears to find a certain unity with the open and infinite sublime spaces of nature. This is a theme that Frederick Edwin Church certainly explores in the heart of the Andes, albeit in a much more dynamic and um, a, yeah, very expressive and painterly fashion, ex exploring what to his most of his viewers would have been entirely new continents. Um, so this vast uh, infinity of the heart of the Andes was a kind of panorama that was brought into you know, the heart of New York City, for instance, where church would charge admission to see something like this. It was sort of the precursor to widescreen movies at the time. As I've mentioned, political change was often on the agenda of romantic artists, and Eugène Delacroix, again, was a master of this in his Liberty Leading the People of 1830, commemorating an important uh, revolutionary episode in the history, the post-Napoleonic history of Paris. Realism is the next movement that supersedes Romanticism in France in the 19th century. And what we see here is an unsparing look at the gritty realities of life in, for instance, a provincial town like Ornan, the origin of the birthplace of Gustave Courbet. This is taken to a new extreme in a kind of very self-conscious and reflective way by Edouard Manet in his Olympia, where he transforms that staple of Western art, the nude, into a much more, if you will, crass and direct examination of the economic and cultural forces that affected women around the time this is painted in 1863. Similar types of uh, sentiments, I think, are seen in Edgar Degas' The Glass of Absinthe, where we have two basically alcoholics in a stupor, you know, facing a life without any apparent purpose or meaning, more typical of the new modern life of uh, mid to late 19th century Paris, for instance. In the style known as Impressionism, uh, Claude Monet uh, develops his ideas about color and light and discards with really many of the verities that had dominated Western art up until this point, certainly dispensing with finish, dispensing with conventional notions of light and shade. He also works out of the studio in what's known as plein air painting to create a very rapidly sketched in impression of the world around him, almost purely in terms of light and color. Uh, Pierre-Auguste Renoir in the Moulin de la Galette gets m many of the same themes going in a lively picture of Parisian uh, recreation entertainment. The new uh, working classes and middle classes of Europe were co going to these public places of amusement, and Renoir creates a similar kind of sense of transient, flickering light and color in this gathering of young couples in uh, Paris. Claude Monet, later in life, is a real master at exploring the possibilities of color and light in his work, uh, such as his water lily studies, uh, developing these to almost abstract extremes. The last current of art in the 19th century that we'll look at just briefly is post-impressionism. And in post-impressionism, we see a number of interesting currents. They can roughly be drawn in two main directions. One is expressive, so we have the example, for instance, of Vincent van Gogh or Paul Gauguin using the forms of art to really express things without any necessary relation to visual appearances. And I think this is an important thing to keep in mind as we go forward into the 20th century, this current. The other aspect is a more analytical style, and this is typified in the work of Georges Seurat and Paul Cezanne, who explore the properties of color, Seurat, in a literally scientific sense, or so he believed at the time, or in Cezanne, with his extreme attention paid to composition and, uh, again, kind of working out Poussin uh, in a more modern idiom. Uh, Cezanne does this with still life, as we see here, and still life with cherries and peaches, and even the landscape with his famous renderings of Mont Saint-Victoire in the south of France in Paris. His bathers revisit a neoclassical subject, but again in a thoroughly modern idiom with abstract patches of paint that begin to take on a life of their own.